In this video, I want to distill down my 20 years plus experience of teaching the A-level physics materials topic into small, bite-sized, fast-paced, easy to understand chunks. Hopefully with a little bit of humor thrown in along the way. Towards the end, I'm also gonna spend two or three minutes just going over the various types of exam questions that in my experience crop up over and over again. So if you think this would be useful, don't forget to hang around. Let's start our whistle stop tour the materials topic looking at Hooke's law and springs. So here's a bog standard kind of spring and in the second diagram we've added a force of F, a weight or something I guess, and in the third one we've got 2F. Now what you'll find is that the force in this case that you add on up to a certain point is proportional to the extension of the spring. Now extension is written in different ways as you float around on the internet so you'll see it as X or X or even E sometimes. So what we're seeing here is that if we put a tensile force, and the word tensile basically means stretching, so if we stretch the spring, the force is proportional to the extension. Well, you might think to yourself, well, that's terribly exciting. And I'd agree with you that it isn't really that exciting. But bear in mind, as with all things physics, that what we're doing is creating models that we can use to describe more interesting things. So we could consider the mass on the spring to be an atom and the bonds between atoms to be represented by the springs. Now that's getting more interesting because it leads us to understand how materials work. Anyway, back to the little formula there. Of course, you will remember that if ever you've got a proportional sign, you can chuck in a constant. And the constant here is known as the spring constant, sometimes written as SC, at least by me, to save time. Uh, force is newtons, length is meters, therefore the spring constant has the units of newtons per meter. Now the spring constant is a measure of how stiff a material is, and stiffness is a measure of how much force you have to put to stretch it. So this is telling us how stiff a material is. So we could continue this work and add 3f and 4f and 5f and plot a graph of force against extension. And if you do that, you'll get something like this. So this is our first graph. This is a very graphy topic is materials. And we've got extension in meters along the bottom there and force in newtons up the side. Normally you would put what you change on the x-axis. So you'd expect forces to be down on the x-axis, but in this case, we swap them around. And that's because the gradient of this line here gives us force over extension, which of course, you know, is the spring constant. So I'm going to rub that off because I'm going to need that space. I've marked a couple of points on the graph there. And the first one is known as P. P is simply the limit of proportionality. So our F equals KX works up until the point P. The second point, perhaps a bit more interesting, is what's known as the elastic limit. Now notice that just between the two points, there's a tiny little section of the graph that is actually curved. So it's not proportional there. Up to the elastic limit, to this point here, you add up whatever this force is, you can add all the way up to that force and then take the forces away from the spring and the spring returns to its original length. In other words, it's not deformed at all. And we call that area, well, it has several names, one of which is the elastic region of the spring. And another one is to say it's the Hooke's law region after Robert Hooke, I guess, who kind of came up with this stuff. After the elastic limit, if you now de-stress the spring, so you put a force of this value on and then take it off again, you'll find that you have permanently deformed the spring. It doesn't go back to its original le length. And so this region of the graph, this curved region, is known as the plastic region. And that's where you get uh, permanent deformation. So a few more words about the elastic region of what's actually going on as you add forces or you stretching the bonds a bit. And if you stretch the bonds and then take the force off, the bonds go back to their original length. And hence, if you stretch the, stretch an object within the elastic limit, it just returns to its normal, its normal original length. If you keep adding force or weights onto the, the spring out beyond the elastic limit into the plastic limit, and not only do you stretch the bond, but likely the layers of particles will slip over each other. They'll actually change their position relative to each other. Now, when you take the tensile stretch away from the material, 
the bonds go back to their original length, but because the layers have slipped, there's nothing to slip them back. They don't push back to where they were, and so you end up with a permanent deformation. So we have here a rather splendid force extension graph with two lines on it. Now I could ask a whole different variety of questions about these lines, but the question I want to ask is let's say these are two different materials. Let's say that one of the lines is copper and the other one is iron. Now the thing is, I'm asking you which of those lines is which, and you might say, well, I know about copper, copper is bendy and iron is pretty stiff. And so probably number one is going to be iron. I mean, that would be a natural assumption. You think iron is stiffer, it's harder to stretch. And of course, it's got a much bigger gradient here. However, it's not that simple because it could be that we have a very, very thin iron wire like this and a great, huge, enormous, great, thick, fat copper wire. It's going to be an awful lot harder to stretch that copper than it is to stretch that steel because the surface area is just enormous in comparison. This means you have to be a little bit careful with these graphs because there's a limit to what they can actually tell us. We need to find a way to get away from the dimensions causing complications if you want to compare different materials. And the way to do that is to use stress and strain because stress and strain help us to consider what you might call the bulk properties for a particular material. And I'll say some more about that in a moment. And in order to do this, we're going to consider mostly in the course we talk about wires. So we'll have a wire of length L and a cross-sectional area is this surface here. So this is nearly always a circle, cross-sectional area A. Don't forget, of course, that's pi r squared. More about that later. And what we're going to do is put a tensile force on it. In other words, we're going to stretch it and the wire is going to stretch out a bit like this. It's going to become a little bit longer. So here we have an extension which we'll call delta L. So this is a setup. We're going to put a big fat force onto this wire. We're going to stretch it and we're going to consider its properties. So we need to make a couple of definitions now. So first of all, let's do stress. And stress is defined as being the force that's applied over the cross-sectional area. So this would be measured in newtons over meters squared. So stress is measured in newtons per meter squared. Now you remember, of course, that this is the Pascal from pressure. So it's often called the Pascal as well. So that's the stress. In the stress, we're just thinking about the force and the cross-sectional area there. Now the next thing that we need to know about is strain. And strain is defined as being the extension over the original length. Now, both of these have units of meters. And of course, that means that the meters and the meters are going to cancel out. So strain has no units. It's just a percentage or a ratio. And it tells us how much the material has grown as a percentage. And because of that, it doesn't matter about its dimensions. So what we'll do now is imagine that in the lab we have a wire and we know its length. We've measured its radius several times in different places, of course, to get a mean. And we're going to then put different forces on it. So Newton, two Newtons, three Newtons, and so on. In other words, we're going to aim to build up a graph of stress against strain as compared to force against extension. This graph is unsurprisingly called a stress over strain graph. And you'll notice it has a whole load of characteristics that are almost identical, or at least similar anyway, to the force extension graph. So we have the straight line region, we have the plastic region, and one or two other things that we'll talk about as we go along. So the really interesting thing about this graph though, is if let's just say this was copper, the wire was made of copper, it doesn't matter what sizes or dimensions this bit of copper wire has. It could be a thin bit, fat bit, long bit, short bit. It will produce the same, firstly the same shape graph, but more than that, it will have the same numbers on it. In other words, this is why stress and strain graphs are so useful. Any old bit of copper, as long as it's not like oxidized or, and as long as the temperature is the same, will produce the same graph. As you might expect, up to the limit of proportionality, the graph is proportional. A point E, just like before, the elastic limit, as long as we don't go beyond that, we won't get any permanent deformation. 
Then you'll see the curve goes round through its plastic region. And then there's this funky little point here. And this little point is known as the ultimate tensile stress. Now it's an interesting little chap at this point because this point at the top here, the ultimate tensile stress, is the maximum stress that the material can hold. If you take, so if you get to that point, whatever value that at maximum stress is, you get to that point and then take a bit of stress off, in other words, re reduce some mass, the wire continues to grow, which kind of is a bit counterintuitive because you think if I put uh, less force on it, it's going to get shorter. I mean, it's not going to back to its original length, of course, but you think it would get shorter, but no, it doesn't. It still carries on growing and then very quickly it's going to get to the point at the end there, often known as B, the breaking stress. You can probably guess what happens at that point. What's also interesting is that as you get into this um, curved region here, you can see that small increases in the stress there are leading to big increases in strain. In other words, our wire is now really growing quickly. It's just possible then that you might be thinking to yourself, well, we've been stretching these wires, so they're absorbing energy. Can we find what that energy is? And unsurprisingly, the answer is yes. So here is a force extension graph again. And as you can see, nice straight line. Here we have a very nice force extension graph. Now you know that force is measured in newtons and extension is measured in meters. Now for every graph you ever see in physics, there are two things you can ask yourself, amongst others, I suppose. One is, does the gradient mean anything? And the other is, does the area under the graph mean anything? Well, in this case, we've got newtons and meters. So the area under the graph is going to have the units of force times uh, extension, whatever that unit is. Or the units of that is newtons, and the units of extension is meters. So it's newton meters. Now, if you're on the ball, which of course you are if you're watching this video, you know that work done is force times distance, or newton meters. Ah, same unit, newton meters, newton meters. And work done, you know, is a measure of energy transferred, which of course is measured in joules. Therefore, the area under this graph is joules. And it represents the energy that's stored in the wire. And of course, because it's a triangle, the area under that graph or the energy stored there is known as the elastic strain energy. And it's going to be equal to a half times the force times the extension, which could obviously be written as delta L as well. We can also take this a step further and consider that we know that the, the force applied to the wire is equal to K times the extension. And so we can now substitute for this force using that force, and that will lead us to another formula for the energy, which is going to be a half Kx times x, which is going to be a half kx squared. So that's the elastic strain energy too. Now, it's at this point that I can go off on one of my really excited tangents, so I'm going to keep it really brief. Isn't it interesting, probably not you might think, that this formula for the elastic strain energy takes the same shape as does the kinetic energy formula? How about that? I wonder what deeper mysteries that is pointing to. Leaving that to one side, now let's consider what the area underneath a stress strain graph is going to be. Well, who would have thought? This too is going to have the units of joules, only this time it's joules per unit volume. Per unit volume. In other words, really, to be honest, a metre cubed. So what this is telling us, the area under a stress strain graph, again, is telling us the elastic strain energy for a metre cubed of the material as you stretch it. Now just try and get your head around what a metre cubed of copper looks like. It's big. So it's going to store an awful lot of energy if you manage to stretch it at all. Hence this one can be flipping big. And just to clarify there, the energy per unit volume, unit volume is going to be equal to a half stress times strain. We're now going to talk about Young's modulus, which is, if you like, the meat and two veg of this topic, the most, probably the most tested part 
if you're thinking about exam questions, which I guess you probably are, if you're here. Young's modulus is given the symbol E and is defined as being stress divided by strain. What we're thinking about here then is actually the gradient of a stress strain graph. So in a way, it bears some resemblance to our old friend that we were looking at right back at the start, the force extension graph. Remember the K, and now we're going to look at the gradient of this, and it's going to be called Young's modulus. So let's dive into this a little bit more. So stress, we know, is force over area. So if we divide that by strain, which is extension over original length, we get one of these rather ugly looking four level fractions. Nobody wants to work with these. And the way to deal with this uh, double decker fraction, if you like, or this quadruple lever fraction, is to remember that you can flip the bottom pair over and then multiply it by the tops. So in other words, this simplifies, and it is a lot simpler, down to E equals F over A times L over extension. Now, if you don't like the mass, this is something to commit to your brain of memory because you will use this over and over again. So what units does Young's modulus have? Well, if it's stress over strain, then it's just newtons per meter squared over, well, nothing because strain doesn't have any units. Therefore, Young's modulus is also measured in newtons per meter squared. And as a general rule, the kind of materials you're going to use in your exam, this is always a big number, generally over 10 to the 10 newtons per meter squared. Many materials, at least the ones that you're going to get tested on, should they come up in the exam, will follow a stress strain graph like this. Now, all that really has happened here is that kind of an extra section zoop, has been added on the end there. So let's talk about what's going on. So we have our traditional and much understood limit of proportionality there. And you can just see that there's a slight curve coming now as we move up to the elastic limit. And we know about the elastic limit, as we said many times already, that's the point to which if you start taking the load off, it will go back to its original length with no strain. Remember, strain is just a measure of how much the material has grown. But what's this new point here? Well, this is known as the yield point. And it's a point that most of us have had some sort of practical experience with, especially those that are perhaps, shall we say, slightly older. Now, in the old days, before you lot remember, we used to go shopping in places called supermarkets. And in supermarkets, you would be given plastic bags. And what happens is you'd fill the plastic bags up with your baked bean tins or your soup tins or whatever it was, and the bag would grow. So you'd be moving up the stress strain curve for the plastic and you'd very quickly get beyond the elastic limit. But if you kept loading the bag, which many of us did, you'd get to the yield point. Now what the yield point is, is that it just goes bananas and just grows and grows, even if you take some of the force out of the bag. And this is the point at which the bag just goes and dies and all your tins fall on the floor or the handle breaks or something like that. Now, many materials will actually behave like that, including some metals. So this is not just a plastic thing at all. And the yield point is when it just, even if you take the force off of it, it just continues to grow. You don't have to put any more load on, it's just gone. How might you compare these two materials? Well, there's a few things you can say about them. Remember that for a stress strain graph, if you take copper as an example, you always get the same graph for it. So it's a bulk. It's showing us a bulk property. It doesn't depend on its dimensions. Therefore, we can say with certainty that material one is stiffer, i.e. harder to stretch, than material two. The next thing we can see is that material two has a long plastic region. So this is something that's going to stretch quite considerably until it actually gives up the ghost and breaks. So this could be a piece of plastic or perhaps more likely because of the long straight proportional area. It's just a piece of copper wire. Copper wire is unbelievably flexible, but it also has a good sized uh, proportional or elastic region. 
The first wire, though, or the first material, has a very long proportional or perhaps elastic area, and then a very short plastic bit. In other words, it'll stretch nicely, elastically, but once you get past its elastic limit, it breaks very quickly. Now, this kind of material is referred to as being brittle. It's brittle because in the process of breaking, the edges of the material don't grow very much. In other words, a brittle material is one that you can break and then fit the pieces back together. Now, we all know brittle materials. Glass is a common one. Another example would be a digestive biscuit. Although, perhaps for a digestive biscuit, you wouldn't get such a steep gradient here because it's probably not very strong, is it? A good example of a material that's brittle is, surprisingly, concrete. Concrete is an amazing uh, natural material, or made from natural ingredients, that when it's compressed, and it's under compressive forces, it's really, really able to take the most enormous uh, forces. When you put it under tensile forces and stretch it, though, it again, it's strong, but it's also brittle, and it will give up the ghost and snap. So you can see that sometimes when you see bits of concrete and there are bits that have been kicked out of them or have fallen out over time. Again, you can sometimes fit the edges back together. I thought it might be worth just mentioning a couple of things I've noticed in my years of teaching about how these questions on materials crop up. You know, and I'm not saying that what I'm gonna to say to you is, is definitely always gonna happen. There are always curveballs in physics exams, as we saw in 2023. But let's take this example. What I've tended to find then is that materials questions, they either crop up as an end point of some other question, particularly a mechanics type question, or they crop up in multiple choices, which I'll talk about in a moment. And on top of that, you may, if you're very unlucky, get something in the practical paper. So a, a typical question there might come, for example, in a moments question like this, where you have a shelf, and a bowling ball don't you put your bowling balls on a shelf and then you might be asked to take moments around this point and consider the tension in this cable now there's a say a common question so you'll probably be given an angle here something like that so anyway you calculate the tension in this rope and then the last part of the question will say this the rope is made of steel and it stretches by this much find its young's modulus or some such like that and so you'd have to use the information that you're given on the cable there to find its Young's modulus. This here is a very typical example of the kind of question that you will get that doesn't seem to bear very much resemblance at all to any of the content that you've done on this topic. Anyway, moaning aside, you're given some properties of a, firstly, a wire W, like its length, its radius. You're told that it's got a load on it and that it extends by this much. You're then asked to consider what happens with a different wire, X, which this time is made of the same material and has the same load. And then you're asked about which length and radius for X will produce a weird extension of a quarter. So basically, what you have to do with these questions is jump into the Young's modulus formula. You know that E equals stress over strain. Look for things that are constant between the two wires. So in this case, they're both made of the same material and have the same load. Therefore, we know if it's the same material, Young's modulus is constant. We also know that the force is going to be constant because it has the same load attached to it. Now, I don't want to get too into explaining how this works because it will take a long time. But fundamentally, you could almost guarantee that you're going to get something like this. I have some worked examples on my website. I'll try and remember to leave the link to that in the description of this video. So hope this was all useful to you. I certainly enjoyed doing it. And uh, let me know, you know, what you'd like me to tackle next. Bye for now.